I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. And that's it's actually a quote. It's uh, still Jian here, although it was uh, empowering for a moment. Still, those Ten Commandments can be pretty commanding, can't they? Those divine moral standards from the Old Testament have shaped laws, institutions, and ethical beliefs for millennia, as well as being the focal point of cultural and religious conflict. But how should we interpret the original intent of the commandments today? Well, my next guest has a few ideas, and he's sure to upset religious purists in the process. That's because he is Christopher Hitchens, the writer, political commentator, and author of God is Not Great, the bestseller that argues religious faith itself is false, unnecessary, and in some cases, and I quote, a threat to human survival. He's in Canada to kick off a series at Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum in association with the ROMS exhibition, Dead Sea Scrolls, Words That Change the World. Mr. Hitchens will give his thoughts on how the Bible's moral codes can be interpreted today, and he'll be asked to add three more commandments to the original ten. But right now, Christopher Hitchens joins me in Studio Q. Hello, sir. How nice of you to have me. It's very good to have you here. Uh, uh, let me start with the obvious. Why is a renowned atheist commenting on something he doesn't believe in? Well, don't think I didn't consider asking the ROM <laughs> why I was getting a twofer um, in this manner. Uh, but um, I should start by saying I'm more of an anti-theist than an atheist. In other words, my view is not just that there is no reason to believe that there is a deity and that all the arguments that there is one have all long since been exploded by philosophers, astronomers, scientists, physicists, biologists, and so forth, um, mainly by philosophers, though, in my opinion, um, but that it's a good thing that that's not the case. In other words, I, I do know some non-believers who wish it was true, hmm. who would think it would be nice if there was a celestial dictatorship. Sure. I can't make myself want there to be a celestial dictatorship. I mean, I, I think it would be the, the absolute definition of unfreedom if there was an unchanging, undying, um, all-supervising, all-knowing father who kept you under surveillance uh, before you were born, all your life, and after you were dead. There's secretly no part of you somewhere inside you that thinks it wouldn't be so bad to hang out in heaven and or uh, live beyond your 80 or so years or however no, long. No, I don't have any big brother envy at all. It's, it's much more a big brother than a big father idea, but I mean, I am a father, and I know one of the jobs of a father is to, as it were, move on. I, I won't put it any more dramatically than that. I mean, get out of the way, give the children some room. If I said to them, hey, children, I'm never leaving. <laughs> uh, you'll always have me, always, forever. In fact, I'm going to be at your funerals, and in the meantime, I'm going to supervise well, you. you. Even after you're dead, I'm going to carry you on go to another it. place. What kind of fatherhood is that? What kind of paradise would it be? No, I mean, if, um, if one was to believe in the supernatural at all, which I don't. I mean, I think the supernatural dimension is, is a man-made illusion. I can see why. Milton makes the devil so attractive because you'd rather be in hell than be serving forever a benevolent dictator. Mm. Well, I mean, to return to my question, so that's paradise it, regained. Interestingly, in your, <laughs> interestingly in your book, you make the case that if the Lord created everything, why does He need commandments? Why, why does He then need to give us rules? Let me flip it on you. If you don't believe in it, why do you need to tell us uh, about your disbelief? Well, staying with my point about the totalitarian and the authoritarian, if you want, in the real world, the only world I think we have, the material world, the physical world, if you want to have power over other human beings. The, the most potent way, that's a bit of a repetition to say potent and powerful, but anyway, the most effective way of claiming and exerting power over fellow humans is to say you're doing it in God's name, that your God's appointed. Mm -hmm. They can't challenge that. You can't just say, hey, I'm me, you should do what I say. Mm -hmm. Well, though people do, um, but they, they can get laughed at, which, which potential tyrants hate. The best thing is to say, no, no, I'm doing God's work here. I am God's representative on earth. Um, that's been, ever since antiquity, the easiest way of uh, establishing di a dictatorship, and the worst dictatorships today are still theocratic ones. So what this all represents is, is an, an argument uh, over unresolved contradictions in the real world, and that, you'll notice, is where priests really want power. Look at, look at the way the Pope behaves. Look at the way the Ayatollahs behave. Look at the way the rabbis you know, on the West Bank 
stealing other people's property mm. in the name of God behave. Do they want power in this world or the next? It's pretty obvious which one they want power in, and property too. Specifically in the case of the commandments, you wrote an essay for Slate a few years ago, and in it you questioned what you called the vague pre-Christian desert morta- morality uh, of the Ten Commandments, which you say show every sign of being invented by a Bronze Age demagogue. So I, I'm, we can assume that you don't have much respect for the, the Ten Commandments. Well, you notice that the Ten Commandments begin by saying don't have any other gods. In other words, they're not even monotheistic. They're saying there are other gods, but I'm a jealous one. <laughs> Choose me. And then that they're all addressed to people who, who don't know about anything except agriculture. I mean, all the commandments are effectively to do with um, animals and agricultural subsistence, except for commandments that every society has. Uh, right. Such as prohibitions against... Murder, lying. Murder, theft, and perjury are the, are the ones that are, I would say, unimpeachable. And then I'm giving... I don't want to give away too much about what I'm speaking of later, but I'll just say this much. I mean, the, the, the Tenth Commandment, which is the one I'm writing independently in another book about, mm. forbidding um, thought, defining thought crime, as Orwell would put it, as Big Brother does put it for the first time. You're not allowed to think about your neighbor's property. Right. You're not allowed to covet. covet. Not allowed, not allowed right. to have the ambition to be as well off as or have the... It's not... You mustn't take your neighbor's property. Uh, you mustn't try and annex it to yourself. Steal it. You mustn't even think about it. The beginning of thought crime, hmm. which is the beginning of the totalitarian idea that you're guilty for thinking things which you may only have been half aware of doing. You may have been half asleep. But You're still condemned. This is very, very dangerous stuff. I mean, you're obviously well-established and renowned as a contrarian thinker, but is this really this black and white for you? I mean, are there no nuances? Are you, 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 you resolutely believe that there's no use for these commandments? Well, no, I'm, to the contrary. I'm sorry. I mean, the, in the Analects of um, Confucius, for example, long before monotheism, it says... Uh, don't do to another person what you would find uh, repulsive if done to yourself. It's, it's actually a, a rather weaker rule than most people realize, but it is what we call the golden rule. It's been around as long as human society has been Don't around. do unto we, thy we, neighbor. We, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't have. We wouldn't, you and I, couldn't have evolved far enough to be having this discussion with this technology if people were any different. I mean, mm. if we didn't have an instinct for solidarity and for common interest and for care of, for one another, um, life would be impossible. The idea that we wouldn't know this without a supernatural authority, however, mm. is a groveling, slavish idea, as if we need permission to know what is innate to us. Religion actually takes its morality from us, not the other way around. So, uh, uh, right. Whereas God didn't create well, humans, uh, humans created God. Is let your me position. put it like this. I mean, if uh, I, I put this question to various people, quite senior religious people in public in debates several times, and they haven't come up with an answer yet. You have to tell me of a moral statement that could be made by a believer, or a moral action undertaken by a believer, that I couldn't make or undertake because I'm not a believer, something that would be uh, impossible for me. I've not yet been told what that would be. Whereas if I ask you the corollary question, can you think of a wicked action done by a believer because of his or her belief, you can think of one right away. The suicide bombing community is all religious. The um, genital mutilation community, not not exclusively, because of the Tamil tigers, I suppose. Who are partly religious, by but the way. but religious but, uh, people wouldn't but claim the that genital mutilation of children is a, a precise is a religious commandment. Right. Uh, these are things that uh, wickedness is that people wouldn't commit without God. So there's well, a, a quite a sharp divorce between ethics and religion, and morality and religion. But I I think you'd be hard pressed to find a religious person who would claim that there's never been any negative implications or violence or or uh, wicked deeds that have been done in the name of religion. They say in the name of. It's not in the name of. That's their get-out clause. You echo it yourself. Don't mean to pick you up on it. Actually, sure. yes, I do. Go ahead. It's not yes, in the name do. of. No, it's explicit. It is part of the religion. The, 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 the most celebrated action of the Abrahamic is the willingness of someone to, to gut and murder his own son because he thinks he will please God. But the flip side of that, I mean, if you say, you go back to Confucius, if, if, if the basic rules of these commandments, some of them, I mean, and I'm thinking from four through eight now, right? Adultery, lying, stealing, uh, be honest. These are basic, if these are basic rules that people use to try and live a good life or try and be good to their fellow citizens, what's wrong with that? Nothing, except that um, the, if you're telling me that the Jewish people wouldn't have known this uh, if they hadn't been at the foot of Mount Sinai, 
and having it on tablets as if from God. Now, as it happens, that story is a myth. I mean, there was no, there was no Egyptian slavery, there was no exile, there was no wandering in the mm. Sinai. All that's made up, but it's still insulting to the Jewish people to say that and without this, they would, they would not have known that perjury, say, just to take one example, was wrong. If they thought perjury was okay, they wouldn't have been able to stick together long enough to get to the foot of Mount mm. Sinai or wherever it was or was not. You're saying that religion or the commandments don't serve the foundation of morality. No, I, that I it also think it's also very dangerous to say that, that what should be effortless, innate, the sort of thing that you don't have to teach to children, is instead something that you, you only can get from an unanswerable dictator, um, from a totalitarian authority who says, I command you this, and in return, mm -hmm. I give you the territory of other people. I'll give you land that I will clear, a holy land that I will clear of the existence of all others. I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll give you the power to murder and slaughter and erase and take away the property of anyone who gets in your way. That's not morality, that's an inducement. But so what do, what do you say to true believers, uh, who those who sincerely question uh, whether true morality can exist in the absence of God? Well, I'd point out to them that they're mistaken. <laughs> and also, I, I, and you do so quite aggressively. Also I, wor also, I worry for them because it, it makes me wonder if they didn't believe in the existence of God, would they stop believing in, in the existence of the principles? I mean, in other words, what is stopping them? I once saw, hmm. it's in my book, which you, you might have mentioned, by the way, is at fine bookstores everywhere. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned bestseller. As fine. A fact. Yeah. Um, it's called God is Not Great, uh, How Religion Points to Everything. Um, I saw a famous debate between a Catholic bishop, Bishop Butler, and um, Professor A.J. Ayer, a great humanist professor. The bishop said to the professor, if you believe there's no God, what stops you from going on an endless campaign of rape, theft, murder, incest, and the rest of it? I mean, and right. I was agog to see this question from a man of, from a man of God, a man of the cloth, as was for A.J. the monstrous thing to say. That that I if I didn't if I didn't agree with you I would become a psychopath. I mean what arrogance! Unbelievable. This from a church, by the way, which has been the empowerer, shelterer, and coverer up of the rape and torture of children for what for decades, if not centuries. Mm. But worse than that, and I pose this question in my book: What's in the bishop's mind? Is he saying to himself, "Thank goodness I believe in um, the resurrection," because otherwise I'd be out there. Raping and pillaging and perjuring. I mean, that's all that's stopping me. Well, but, that's, but, a that's a huge confession for the guy to make. But, I think. But clearly, you disagree. I think I'm sorry to say I have enough self. No, I'm not sorry to say. Right. I'm glad to say I have enough self respect in my own instance mm -hmm. to say, no, I'm, that's not what stops me. It's not the fear of hellfire that stops me doing these things. But, I mean, and you do make that point. Or the fear of some posturing priest. But if the priest or the believer uh, who says, uh, it's because I want to go to heaven, or it's because I believe in this set of rules, uh, then therefore doesn't do those things, doesn't, Frank, uh, then doesn't I have a great Then I have a great Sufi prayer for those people, for a very fine old wise man of, um, of uh, antiquity who said, who prayed and said, God, if I, if I believe in you for the fear of heaven, deny me heaven. If I believe in you out of... Um, did I say fear of heaven? Out of wish for heaven. Mm. Out of the desire for heaven, deny me heaven. If I, if I only believe in you out of fear of hell, send me straight to hell. D don't, I mean, th it matters what the motive is, what mm. the state of mind is. In but Chris, surely there's people who are doing good things in the world in the name of religion. Would you agree to that at least? I mean, whether it's liberation theology or whether it's Certainly digging not wells and theology, well, no. what well, liberation theology is nonsense, sinister nonsense. Well, what it, do, would you agree that there's anything in the world that has been done in the name of religion that's positive? Well, Habitat it, for humanity. It falls I under would, the it falls under not with, so things done by Jimmy Carter are done by Jimmy Carter. Hmm. Um, if you're telling me people wouldn't help build affordable housing if, it were, if they weren't Baptist fundamentalists, no, I'm telling you that they do do it for those statement. reasons. Well, if they, then let them do it. It just says nothing about their faith. Carter's faith is still nonsense. Carter's, the, the, the guy who runs Habitat for Humanity, is still the guy who goes to the Israelis and says, the problem with you is you've abandoned the prophetic tradition. Mm -hmm. You've walked away from your religion. You've become too secular. That's what's wrong with your state. A, 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 a wicked and ridiculous thing to be saying. He can, he can hammer as many nails into as many staircases as he likes for the rest of his life. He won't make up for the, for the horror of that remark.
When you, I'm wondering who, when you write a book, or like his you, belief in UFOs, when, <laughs> or his belief that he's been born again. When once is quite enough with a guy like Carter, believe me. When when you write a, a book like God is not great, which I I, I think is a, uh, if if not provocative, a tremendously entertaining read. I mean, it's a, it's 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 a, and available at fine bookstores. <laughs> thank you. Yes, nationwide. Uh, do, tell me who you think your audience is, because you're quite aggressive with your argument. And really, if you want to, I mean, this is going to, if you really want to change things, it's, it might take some effort, you know, to over, overcome organized religion in the world. But I'm wondering if the tact of saying, hey, being a little softer in your approach might uh, be more effective than, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you're going to find a receptive audience for believers who just uh, hear someone who's very oh, well, aggressively reason, telling well, them they're I wrong. Know, I, know what, I know what, you, what you're saying, and you're kind, to, you're kind to give me tactical advice, but um, when I launched the book, I said to my publishers, I don't want to do the liberal traditional book tour, uh, you know, Toronto, New York, uh, Vancouver, Seattle, Los Angeles, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the South of the United States, and, and I want to get a challenger in every city we go to, whether it's Atlanta or Little Rock or so forth, and we have a debate about it, not just do a reading in, a, in an upscale bookstore. And so that's how it did get launched, and that's why it's a bestseller, because I get invited not less than twice a month to either the campuses or the pulpits of the American Christian right. Do you think you win people over who are sure. already I will if I don't. Converts? If I don't, I'd give them reason to rethink. I, can, I can't say I win them over. I know I've won some people over, but that's not... The point, the point, I'm not trying to convert by definition. I have, I'm not in the conversion business, but, but forcing them to confront what they believe and to re-examine it. That's been the whole success of the book, actually. And I think if I'd moderated my tone or made it seem as if I could split the difference with them, there would be much less to debate. Um, one needs uh, as much heat as one needs light, because light is um, only produced by heat. Hmm. I don't want to suggest that, that it's an epidemic, but there does seem to be a big surge of interest in uh, atheism or uh, anti-theism in your case. Uh, not only your book, God is Not Great, uh, which is available apparently in uh, bookstores across the nation, but, but Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, Bill Maher's popular movie, Religulous. Uh, there's atheist bus ad campaigns. Yeah. Why is this all happening now from Because people are fed up with theocratic bullying, both at home and abroad, and they've had too much of it, and they're fed up, I think, also with our profession, our, yours and my great profession, which always treats people as if they, the, the assumption is that they're religious unless you hear it to the contrary, as if everyone is a person of faith or that, as if faith was something to be respected. Actually, people are annoyed with this assumption. Um, the fastest growing minority in North America is of those who check the box that say none of the above when asked what faith they profess. As people open their daily paper and look around the world, they see the nightmare of a theocracy going nuclear in um, both um, imminently, perhaps both in um, Iran and in Pakistan. They see what the parties of God are doing to ruin Iraq and Lebanon. Um, they see the mad uh, Jewish settlers in the West Bank trying to bring on Armageddon and the Messiah by stealing other people's property. They see uh, arrogant, ignorant cretins in the United States mm -hmm. trying to teach nonsense to children in school by law, uh, trying to stultify children with creationist babble. And they've had enough of it. And they don't like the, the easy assumptions made by politicians like Bush that if you can just pronounce the word faith, that you've covered yourself on this. I mean, I think it's high time for a pushback, and I'm very proud to be Part of it. But what you've talked about in terms of the growth of the non-believers uh, um, and the recognition, in fact, from President Ob Obama a, a couple of times now in talking about uh, non-believers does seem to fly in the face of the orthodoxy in, in, in which the world is becoming a more religious place and, uh, and, and more polarized as such between the growth of uh, Christianity or, uh, or, or the Bible Belt, et cetera, in the U.S. and, and Islam in, in the Middle East. And, uh, so, so why do we hear so much well, about these things that? Don't go, these things don't come and go in even uh, measurable waves. For example, the fastest growing religion in South America is probably a Pentecostal or Protestant desert. The Catholic Church is on the defensive there. On the other hand, in Africa, the Catholic Church is growing very rapidly. Um, Islam is having several civil wars within itself, uh, both between the, the modernizers and the fundamentalists, but also between the Sunni and the Shia, um, between both of those and discrepant sects like the Ahmadi, for example, or the Ismaili Muslims. So there's a permanent roiling about which kind of faith it is, impervious um, 
though that may seem sorry impenetrable though that may seem to the outsider and so forth but the there is a steady growth of people who say enough of this um, we can live a moral life without religion and the most successful societies are those that separate the church from the state by law and enforce it by their constitutions these are the happiest most prosperous most democratic countries and we have to stop taking this for granted and be willing to defend it against the endless attempts by theocrats of different stripes to take that away from us. That on this line, we will take a stand and we will fight. We being the, the atheist community, almost no, like you're no, an organized many, group. No, many, many people who don't believe in God, uh, of course, will be involved. But many people who uh, are in doubt or are agnostic, uh, but who think that, say, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution is worth fighting for, that the Congress shall make no law establishing a religion, that no one's entitled to define their country, okay, I got this, you. yours or mine, as a Christian one, say, let alone as a, as a, a potentially one day Muslim one, as people are now starting to demand. One day the caliphate will extend to Canada too if you're really right. lucky. No, no, no. Look what happened to Iran when that happened. Look how they ruined and beggared a great civilized country. And one that I know you know about. A, lo a lot has happened to Iran. Yes. Well, Chris, you're here in Canada to uh, ostensibly to add three commandments to the original uh, ten. What What do you think is missing from the Ten Commandments? Uh, what, what What will you be bringing to the stage? Well, I can tell you what is otherwise commanded in the Bible. I mean, and very near in verses, very closely uh, adjunct to the famous ones. Remember, the Ten Commandments appears twice in the text. It's in um, Exodus and it's in Deuteronomy. Um, slightly different versions. And there are all kinds of other instructions in between. And these include genocide, uh, rape, uh, slavery, um, mutilation of children, and so on. So you could, you could probably get an idea of what I might recommend um, for commandments um, if you thought of what the Bible already did recommend that was horrible. And I, again, I'll end on, on the question I always uh, emphasize. If people think that religion is morality, they, they have to account for the immoral things that religion demands that people do. It's not in the name of. It's in the word of God himself. These are commandments and instructions. For, these are warrants for genocide, rape, slavery, infant mutilation, and worse. Um, by working out what the negation of those would be, how, how to, humans can emancipate themselves from the, the evil propaganda um, of a man-made God, then you could probably guess what my contrary recommendations would be. Well, it's a circuitous route, but I, I think I follow you. I know you can. I know your intuition is up to it. <laughs> Let me end off here. Even outside of the context of religion, we can probably all agree that we still have to le lead our lives by certain values. What do you think it takes to lead a good life? Um, for me, um, irony, um, literature as the source of reflection on moral and ethical and human topics, um, laughing at the misfortunes of others, that gets me through a lot of the day. Um, uh, love, uh, and some of the things that go with. Um, the possibility of passing on your genes to children, the only kind of immortality you'll ever get. And did I mention this already? Laughing at the misfortune of others. <laughs> and, and also and being proved right, um, being vindicated in arguments that where other people wish they hadn't had with you. But they have to say, okay, I was wrong and you were right. Uh, and, maybe that and, one. And when maybe they do that, that you maybe can that, laugh at maybe, their misfortune. Maybe that one above all. And also adding terrifically to the, <laughs> the gale of laughter one can have at the, the sufferings that they're undergoing. Christopher Hitchens, I, I, I thank you for this. Thanks for making the time to come in today. Oh, it's an honor. Thanks for having me. Christopher Hitchens is the author of more than 10 books, including God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And Christopher Hitchens joined me here live in Studio Q.